Greetings and welcome back to the Shift Briefing Series. I'm David Pearson. In this video, I want to talk about Colonel John Boyd's OODA loop, its application to police work, and how you can use it on a daily basis. Let's get started. So before we get into kind of how the OODA loop fits into law enforcement, I want to tell you a little bit about my understanding of the OODA loop. The OODA loop, which is observe, orient, decide, and act, was developed as a way to process information by Boyd. And he used kind of a uh, proof of concept or demonstrated this through challenges. Boyd was a fighter pilot, and he would challenge other fighter pilots um, to try to explain this OODA loop thing. And Boyd would say, look, I'm going to be up in the air. We're going to do kind of a, a simulated uh, dogfight, and I'll be ahead of you in my plane, and you'll have a shooting solution on me. So they'll be up flying around. And within a minute, Boyd would say, look, I'm going to be behind you, and I'll be in a simulated shooting solution on you. And everybody that took him up on that challenge lost. Boyd would get up in the air, and through this OODA loop concept, he would work faster than the pilot behind him. In other words, he knew that if he turned right, um, the pilot through training was going to make a certain maneuver. And then he would continue these maneuvers, um, and then the pilot would try to catch up to him. And because Boyd went faster in his OODA loop, he was able to now get behind that pilot and take advantage of him. You, you've experienced kind of some of this stuff when you've learned a new game, a board game like chess or checkers, or if you're an online gamer. You, when you're first learning that, you're kind of going slow through your OODA loop. You're making moves or you're doing things, and there's somebody that's better than you that's kind of already understanding what you're going to do. They take advantage of you, and either they beat you in chess or they destroy you in that online game. So let's talk a little bit about how this fits now into law enforcement. I'm going to give you kind of my own take of the OODA loop, but I'm also going to talk to you about Master Sergeant Paul Howell's book, Leadership and Training for the Fight. And I'm going to kind of throw some of his ideas in there. So first, let's talk about observe. When we talk about observing, we use all of our senses. We might be listening to see if there's truly a disturbance going on or on a um, welfare check, can we smell a body? But much of what we take in is through sight. Some people will say up to 85% of the information that we get is through the gift of sight. And what I want to talk about is slowing down. A lot of times we get going really fast, and when we do, we don't see everything that we need to see. Think about when you're driving and you're going with your family or friends. And you're, if you're driving like me, you're cutting through traffic and trying to cut everybody off. And then they say, hey, did you see the, you know, that store back there? Or did you see that beautiful garden or whatever? And I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. It's because I was paying so attention, paying so much attention to going fast and staying on the road. I missed all the, the little details. And those details are really, really important when we go to that next step of Orient. Now, when Hal talks about um, observe, he talks about a couple of things. First, he tells you to learn where to look. In other words, the world is a big place. Inside of a house is a big place. You need to learn to look where your threats might be. The other thing that Hal talks about, he said, I used to train, uh, and this was for shooting, I used to train people to look at the hands first. If there was a weapon, then they would respond. But he talks about so many blue on blue incidences around the country, he started to change that. And he said, first I teach them, look at the whole body first, process it. Can you see a badge? Do you see some sort of insignia that says either deputy sheriff or police officer? Then look at their hands. Make that first assessment and then go to the hands so that we're not shooting our own. The next step is orient. And you kind of develop your orientation abilities through your knowledge, training, and experience. I call the orientation phase the database phase. And what I mean by that is you take all that information that you gather during the observation phase and you kind of apply it to a database. Is this a suicidal subject, a motor vehicle theft, um, a DV, or just an assault? And you take 
that information and you plug it into that database and then you kind of work that problem. And that's why I think it's so important to make sure you go slow because it's going to be important that you observe the right information. If you go too fast and get it wrong, the data is going to put you into the wrong database. So I think that's really important to understand and that's why I stress so much slowing down. Hal talks about the orientation phase as orienting yourself to the threat. So as you come on a house, where do you park? How do you approach? What's your use of cover and concealment? When you're, when you're inside of a structure, are you orientating yourself to that threat by using good search methods and covering your angles and your partner's back? And then when you finally come into contact with somebody, where do you stand and how close do you get? The next phase is going to be the decide phase. And when we talk about the decision phase, it's important to understand that all our decisions should be based in law, policy, and ethics. And with that in mind, understanding that many of the things that we deal with are rapidly evolving, tense, and uncertain circumstances, I think it's important that we know pretty much dead cold some issues in terms of our policy. What's our pursuit policy? What's our ability to use force? Can I chase this person or not? Um, how do I deal with search and seizure? And then what about dealing with suicidal subjects? So making sure that you understand those things I think is important because oftentimes you're not gonna have the ability to look up those policies and procedures. Hal talks about the decision or decide phase as um, the keep it simple stupid method. He says, if your decisions are overly complex, you leave more room for error for those people that are gonna follow your decision. So think about what you wanna do, but keep it simple and then pass that information on. Our last step is act. And I like to say act decisively, but assess critically. When we act decisively, we're acting right away, we're not hesitating. The longer that we hesitate, the more the circumstances might change, and therefore it's gonna change everything that we're doing. And when I say assess critically, assess your action if it's not working. Don't let your ego get in the way and say, well, this is my idea, we have to keep trying it. Change it, get some other ideas in there. Let somebody else come up with something, but don't hold on to a bad idea. Hal talks about this act phase, and he talks about practicing, and I'll explain that in a minute. But if you've been to one of my classes before, you'll, you've probably heard this quote, and it's from a buddy of mine, Mark Neal, and it actually came from somebody in Greece, but I don't know how to pronounce his name. And the quote is, um, you're not gonna rise to the occasion, you're gonna fall to the level of your training. In other words, you're not gonna shoot like James Bond or fight like Jason Bourne if you haven't practiced to that level. And so, Hal talks about this whole idea of practicing and practicing and practicing. He talks about his shooting and he says 30% of the time it's live fire shooting when he's practicing it. 70% of the time it's dry firing. It's the manipulation, it's the trigger pull, it's all those things. So for you, whether it's a takedown or a shot that you have to take or breaching a door or some sort of physical activity, if you haven't practiced that to the level that you need to, you run the risk of failure. So it's important that you practice, practice, practice. So I'm gonna move into a couple of tips uh, for using the OODA loop. And the first tip, and this is something that uh, a friend of mine, Bob Sorensen and I were talking about. Bob's from the Federal Bureau of Prisons. And he said, you gotta learn the game first. And I thought that was pretty cool. You can't out OODA loop somebody if you don't know the rules of the game. Think about learning chess. You can't sit down with a great idea and an ability to understand OODA and out OODA loop somebody in a game of chess if you don't know how the pieces on the board move or the rules of the game. So be a student of your game. Make sure that you're thinking about that on a daily basis. The second tip I would give you is practice. Every day that you go on a call, you can practice certain things. The thought process on immediate action drills and ambushes, how you approach a person and how you deal with them. Thinking about what are they doing and how can I interrupt their OODA loop with the way that I stand, or maybe it's a touch and a distraction or I say something different. I talk about using 
um, a building that you've just searched as a practice area. A lot of times, and I've seen guys and gals, and I've been guilty of this too, is we just walk through and we search in, uh, the house for somebody and nobody's there and we leave. Instead of going, hey, you know what? We probably could have done this angle or this corner or this room better. And that's a free opportunity for us to practice um, our movement skills. And the last thing I would tell you is, don't think of OODA in a linear fashion. If you do, you're gonna be as I was when I first learned chess. I move, I wouldn't pay attention to what they were doing, I'd make my next move because I had this plan in my mind. And the next thing you know, I can't move anymore because they've moved their pieces in such a way that I get destroyed. Truly understanding the OODA loop and it's more complex and um, in its more complex nature is thinking inside the other person's OODA loop. How is that person likely to do? If I'm playing chess, what are they trying to do and how can I move my pieces and position myself so that I can block what they're trying to do? And on a call, that's what we really wanna do when we start talking about working inside of somebody else's OODA loop or accelerating ours, is not thinking about what we're doing, but looking at the circumstance and the situation as a whole and, and how can we create, as Sid Heal would talk about, tactical dilemmas for our opponents so that we can be successful in our call. Thanks, I hope you um, enjoyed this video on the OODA loop. Uh, more videos to come, and until next time, be smart, be safe, and be efficient. Take care.